Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of CMAS, the Christian Masculinism Podcast. And today we're talking about the seven signs of cultural suicide. And with me to do this are our usual panel. We've got Elliot Hulse. Elliot, how are you doing? All is well. Happy to be here. Brilliant. Elliot is a strength coach known for making millions of men strong mentally and physically. We've got Tim Gordon as well. Tim, hey. What's up, guys? How are you doing? Yeah, very well, thanks. Tim is father of seven, like myself, and the author of The Case for Patriarchy, which is a great book covering many of the topics we explore on this show. So make sure to check that out. And we also have Dr. Roblot as well. How are you doing today? Not bad. How's it going, guys? Brilliant. Ex-Army Ranger and all-around good dude who left academia after he realized it had left him. Check out his article on that topic if you haven't seen it yet. Similar to myself in the, the dream job turned into a nightmare. So the seven times, seven signs we're looking at today, quick rundown. We've got women in blood sports, decaying cities, falling fertility, unmarried males, abortion, trashing tradition, and feminism more broadly. These are seven features of Rome in its decaying stages. And we're going to argue that these are all around us today. And we need to get into a bit of the reasons why they are and why cultures can't thrive with the weaknesses that are underlying all these seven features. So let's take the first one. We're thinking about women in blood sports. This is something that Tim in particular feels very passionately about not just blood sports but competitive sports in general but women in MMA specifically or Dr. Roblard might want to comment on this one women in frontline combat so women in the military what we saw in Rome was topless female gladiators being made to fight male dwarves that was one of their main forms of entertainment Nero took the senators' wives and made them fight to the death. And there's this idea that you can tell the spiritual health of a culture by how it treats its women. Any thoughts on this, guys? I mean, you're not going to produce fertile women when you're sticking them all in the Colosseum or you're sticking them all in the WNBA arena. They're, you're not encouraging, as a culture, the women to reproduce, to get married young, to be virginal until they're married, and to be fecund, to have lots of kids. It's that simple, right? I mean, you're encouraging them to be men when you train women to go fight. And that's what sports are. Whether or not it's a blood sport, I, I mean, blood sports are especially egregious. We're all in agreement there, but... Sports are all, to the extent that they're a good sport, training for military, training for protection, it, it, at some level training for uh, police, martial powers of the state. And to the extent that you're confused, you're riddled with schizophrenia as a society, that you can't even tell the difference between men and women. And Rome did have gender dysphoria, like you've been all over Twitter pointing out, Will they're not going to be fertile, the women. And the men won't either. But but as far as the, the nation's women, Fulton Sheen says we should be a judge based on how we treat our women. And so they're more a, a, you know, a litmus test. But of course, as go the women, so go the men as well. Not Not because of women leadership, but because of the exigencies of human procreation. When women start trying to be men, men will either continue trying to be men, in which case they would be engaged in some sort of homo relationship, or the men will kind of uh, take the open slot, which is acting effeminate. So it's, it's a very, very telling number one. I was impressed that you had that as your number one on your seven, seven item list, Will. You mentioned Fulton Sheen there, Tim. Let me just give you that full line because I think it's so important. And then Elliot or Michael, if you want to pick this one up afterwards, Fulton Sheen's observation is that to a great extent, the level of any civilization is the level of its womanhood. 
when a man loves a woman, he has to become worthy of her. The higher her virtue, the more noble her character, the more devoted she is to truth, justice, goodness, the more a man has to aspire to be worthy of her. The history of civilization could actually be written in terms of the level of its women. So if we've got a culture that's encouraging women to get down and dirty in the combat arena or just to give it up easy sexually, what does that say about the culture overall? Well, if I could, to, uh, <clears throat> it's kind of like what happened in the garden now, isn't it? Right? Like in order to take down Adam's domain, Satan snuck in and the snake talked to his girl. And it seems that that's what happens with the downfall of societies. As you said, men will follow the women. It seems an archetype or a pattern that's cross-cultural. It seems that it's over time. It seems like it's cyclical and just keeps happening. And maybe it's just a sign of the, of, of, I, I don't know if we'll ever overcome it. I think this is something that just is, it's, it's societal rot at some point. Satan sneaks in and tells the women to behave a certain way, like Eve, gain power, uh, be a man, do what you want. Uh, don't listen to your husband. You don't need a father. You don't need men. And then the society sinks and falls into decay until it rises again. And both men and women find their rightly ordered places because the pressures of nature say so. And then we become decked once again and fall into the same trap. It's just a shame that we can't look back and say, look, dudes, isn't it so obvious we're going down the, damn, the wrong road? And, uh, and it's happened before. It's happening now. Let's stop it before it's too late. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just reminded of that uh, that meme that's been going around where it's, you know, hard times make hard men, hard men make easy times, easy times make easy men, easy men make hard times. And it's, I wonder to what degree, whether it's late stage Rome or where we are now, we've really been coasting off of the largesse and uh, strength of our forefathers and uh, we're taking a lot of things for granted. And that makes individuals men and women and the culture at large just start getting lazy and lackadaisical and it becomes this kind of like lazy river then you wake up and and uh you know your your society is just degenerated uh so i think there's something like that that cyclical effect we're, we're very much seeing again yeah while we could acknowledge the truth of that we don't want to see it as any kind of victim narrative because saint augustine's take on that was such as we are such are the times we are the times he basically said no matter what kind of level of degeneracy you might be born into and find around yourself you have the the strength the choice even the obligation as an individual to live well and if enough of us do that then we can swim against the tide and that's a big part of what this podcast is all about elliot and yeah, Tim, also, yeah could, could, could i say one more thing on that yeah no well we don't want to, I mean, it's absolutely true that past this prologue, but we don't want to fall into cyclical determinism because the mm -hmm. Romans were pre-Christian. They were a bunch of pagans, you know, and uh, so it's really important that Christians don't just accept your list well, which is ingenious, by the way, as a fait accompli. Like we can change it. And we also have the graces of the sacraments. We have the graces of scripture. We have the graces of the liturgy. So we, we have no excuse. We have less excuse than the Romans did. That's all I want to point out mm. today. Mm. Yeah, for sure. And the, the comment that Elliot made, Tim, you made it as well, that uh, men follow women. This isn't actually the way things are supposed to be. Men are supposed to be leaders. It's true in the sense that women are, to use terms from evolutionary biology, the, the limiting factor in reproduction and sex is a big motivator for men. And that one of the big aims of the radicals behind the sexual revolution was controlling the behavior of young women to get at men and thereby get at the family, which is the original social cell, and then destabilize everything because of that. But this is where Tim's idea of weaponized chastity comes back in. If you're a man wanting to live well, you don't take the bait of 
a woman who's going to give herself to you sexually without any responsibility or duty asked from you? Yeah, I mean, falling fertility rates are coupled at the hip to rejecting weaponized chastity, re rejecting the weapon of weaponized chastity. In other words, if one doesn't, if a man doesn't grasp with both hands, the notion that he is in charge of his sexual re reproductivity and that really is that the helm of the family before he even technically drives the ship of the family, then it means he's going to be engaged in all kinds of fornication, which means he's going to habituate contraception, which is going to uh, cross pollinate a bunch of your other categories. Well, like if you're not sexually chaste, as, as ancient Rome wasn't sexually chaste in its degenerative centuries, which I guess were technically Christian, they just wasn't yet popular when, when Rome was declining. It wasn't popular till you know three and a half centuries after Jesus. But if you don't do that, then you one can see secondary outgrowths, which will yield all of your other several of your other seven signs, and then you also see primary outgrowths that are that are pretty obvious. Like if you're going to fornicate, you're going to contracept. If you habituate contraception, as all of America has then even marital people, even married people use contraception. It's because they habituated that in their singlehood, you know? So it, yeah, there's, there's, this is a mini headed hydra and uh, chastity during the single years seems to be at the, at the entry point. Yeah, for sure. And just to clarify what you're saying there, Tim, the, the Christians and the Jews at the time that Rome fell were the only fertile communities remaining. And they were the only ones who had really swum against the tide of sexual degeneracy. So chastity is what helped them stay fertile. So it's a great observation there. We've got a question coming in. Let me see if I can add this to the screen so people can read it. If nature will force things to go back to normal, then it's also nature that is making them bad now. It's circumstances, not Christianity's favorite scapegoat, Satan. Anybody want to take a stab at this one? I've got some thoughts on it, but you guys hit it first. Are we saying it's all just nature? It's natural that things have turned out this way, and if we wait long enough, it's natural they'll go back again. I think it depends on how we're, we're unpacking and defining the term nature, right? I mean, you, yeah, you could right. define it in such, such a broad scope that nature just is everything, right? You know, every contingent thing that occurs is counted as nature. But in the sense that we've been using it here, uh, we're particularly referring to natural law and the, uh, you know, metaphysical, epistemological, moral features of that. Uh, so I think maybe we would have to get into questions of how do we define something that isn't nature and, and is nature, and then we, we can go from there. Yeah. I'm I'm gathering that uh, Al Alaric is using the term under the auspices of the nature nomo, uh, fusus nomos dichotomy, uh, nature versus convention, whereby the only thing that ought to be set apart for analysis from nature is man. And uh, I, I think that critique is an old one. It's one we've heard from the four horsemen for a, a few decades now. It's especially impotent because it presumes what it sets out to prove, which is a petitio principio, right? It's a formal fallacy. What you ought to be trying to prove Alaric, if you want to prove uh, moral and epistemic determinism, is that man's will is like the rest of nature, utterly determined, right? Which you haven't you haven't embarked on that. Instead, there's evidence all over the place. Even the scientific determinists, like Cornell West, me and Mike always make these jokes. They'll say things which sound deterministic, like man has no moral say in what he does but then they'll say oh white racism 
central problem in all of the universe. Well, I thought we were just this little animal mm -hmm. speck that is utterly materialistically, reductionistically determined. So they're, they're always dithering your side of things, Alaric, on whether or not mankind is determined. Well, why get rid of a Thomas Jefferson statue, man? I think he was a pretty, pretty based president. And if he was just to determined to own slaves, then what are you upset about in the first place? So not only do you contradict yourself, Watts, but you're presuming what you set out to prove. And even the Greeks understood that the nature convention dichotomy implied that man was responsible for what he did, like for even the pagan Greeks, like the gods, they would say. It's nonsense. And even the fact that you're raising the criticism, this is part of um, Aristotle's retorsion technique from, from uh, what is the physics book Gamma 3, <laughs> it, it, you know, where I can take what you're, a principle that you're attempting to critique, and I'm saying you actually believe in it by virtue of the fact that what you, I can't prove a first principle, but what I can show you is that in operating a critique, of the principle of man's morality, you're presuming a principle of man's morality. And uh, it, it seems like without stronger evidence, you've just got to assume all the people out there, just because they're in a giant plurality, they bear just as much moral burden as the most egregious white slave owner or, or whatever would get you really hopping mad. You know what I mean? So. If you say, well, the times, 2022, they seem really sleazy, that's just because more and more people have bought into sleaziness and they're just as guilty, just as accountable as pick your favorite sinner and your favorite sin. Yeah, that's a great answer. The, the, the root of moral evil is free will. And as Tim's explained, humans aren't merely reducible to nature in this sense that this question is assuming because our free will and our intellect mean that we partly transcend it there's a sense in which human nature natural law like michael was using the term means that the way that rome was acting can't work in the long run we can see in the russian revolution for example trying to abolish the family that doesn't work that fantasy of human beings doing without the family eventually just shatters on the rocks of the reality of what human nature is. So in that sense, it will bring things back naturally, but we still have a choice. Humans can either act in accordance with their rational nature or not. And that's what we're really talking about today. So yeah, Alaric, you're, you're famous, but I would argue that uh, after Tim's answer, it's a kind of, uh, infamy dude we need to uh come back and then uh hear some more from you on that thought about what you mean by nature all right number two decaying cities we've got the fact that in falling rome the high-rise slums replaced the great buildings and they also stopped building great monuments as well and many of you will have seen kenneth clark's famous bbc series civilization and he argues that the main thing it requires is confidence in the society in which one lives. And the three things that are deadly to civilization are basically fear, boredom, and exhaustion. And if you can get the people in a culture afraid, bored, and exhausted, then you don't even need to bomb them. You haven't got to invade. You just wait, especially, as we'll come to later, if they're killing their own kids in the womb anyway. So, guys architecture the state of modern cities as a symptom of spiritual decline and a sign that our culture is la lacking confidence in itself hmm. i just think about how the difference between cain and abel in the Bible, where one was nomadic and the other one was more static, and the difference uh, God in, in God's response to them, uh, I'm not saying that cities are bad. 
and I'm not saying that staying static is a is a bad thing, but there seems to be some uh, degenerating effect to m compiling and massing up upon one another and being comfortable in our mm -hmm. in our status quo, having everything shipped in from all over rather than having to get out and go get it. Um, it seems once again that this is cyclical where uh we that you think about the tower of babel right so of course cain and abel but then there was a deluge but then once again we start converging we start coming together in cities we start making ourselves gods through technology right no longer do we need to produce uh from the land or uh or, or raise cattle or be shepherds we can bring everything up to us in order to raise ourselves up and so I guess my mind goes to what is this human inclination towards cities and, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, I guess ultimately that then becomes uh, the rot of a society, cities. And then what do we do? Do we spread out? Is it, the, uh, is it the movement away? And it seems that that's what's happening in America anyway. More and more people are leaving the cities once they've begun recognizing the rot. And so... I don't necessarily have an answer to that, but it just makes me ponder. Are cities antithesis to humanity? Are we not built for cities? Yeah, I think that that's, that was my instinct to think, like, have, have there ever been cities that are uh, benign, you know, or is it something about cities just in general where it becomes this, this focal point of, of consumerism and consumptive behavior and yeah, people, they're, they're not rooted in the land. They're not producing, uh, you know, in cities now you have like, uh, gayborhoods, I guess, right. Where, um, it's just the gentrification by the gay community. And when you think about it, that's that I, that's like the ideal consumer, you know, that's the ideal consumer individual. And yeah. I don't think it's a, um, a coincidence that those things are, are, uh, you find those together. Um, so I just wonder if in cities in general, there's it's just symptomatic of some type of rot going on more largely, and, and maybe the country and the land is always sort of better. I was going to throw in a bit of a curveball here. The neighborhoods. Uh, it's interesting that you say that because I began to notice that pattern as I moved out in my life. And so I was in St. Petersburg, Florida, which was a very small up and coming city, which needed to be gentrified. And... I discovered that that was synonymous with become gay. And so the the more <laughs> affluent the city became, the more beautiful it, the city became, the more literally homosexuality became centralized in the city. I remember when I first moved there, the there was a, there was the gay ghetto, I guess you could say on the outside, but by the time I left, Central Avenue became mm -hmm. The, the gay center spot. And so of course I started noticing a pattern. I moved out here to his, where it's far more country in Lake County, you know, Pinellas County is, is, is heavily populated, very city focused. Um, but even here with the small cities, I'm, I'm about, I'm between two cities and both of them are about 30 minutes away from me. And to the degree that the city is adopted LGBTism and has gayness is to the degree that this, that the city is flourishing. And so that's a, uh, it's a strange coincidence and I'm happy you brought that up. I just wanted to point out that pattern I've seen. Yeah. yeah. Tim. Well, I talked about this on my show earlier this week just to, to zoom back another 10 or 20,000 feet. There's a crisis in Western civilization that's predicated on the fact that sometime in the late 1800s, by some shadow party, we don't need to struggle with who that shadow party is for now, all the eight or nine institutions of culture in the West were stormed, all of them every last one, including our Roman Catholic Church. And it seems to have begun even that holiest of holies, which should have been the final institution to be stormed by radical insurgents, subversives. It should have been the last. That was even underway around the turn of the century. And Leo XIII writes about it, Pius X writes about it. 
all eight or nine cultural institutions such that what we behold now in 2022, end of the year, is we don't even know, like, WTF is going on with our save, our supposed human saviors, uh, the right wing. I don't even mean the in, in American politics. I don't even mean the corrupt Republican Party. We've known they're rhinos. We know they're fake. But even the conservatives, I mean, look at all of the subterfuge, even on the Kanye West campaign. People are like, is this guy a Fed? Is that guy a Fed? This glows, that glows. We are utterly at an index of negative credibility. It's a credibility gap. And, uh, and it's a credulity gap on the part of the people. So this exists especially potently in the cities. But it also exists in rural areas where I live. I mean, people just, they have TVs and they know that the institutions have been stormed. The deep state's a real thing. The deep state produces infiltrators. No, we don't know who those infiltrators are. So it's a bit like pod people. We're, we're looking at one another. I mean, not, not us four guys. We trust each other. But you look at even some of the, the, the major right wing figures here in America, and you're like, I don't know if I trust that guy. I think that's a, a symptom of what's gone on civically in, in the cities. I think it's an especially stark instantiation of, you know, the Roman Senate, where you, at any time, you know, tragedy is Caesar. You could, you could be knifed by people that are pretending to be your partisans. Right. The thought I've just had about this is... Uh that principle of the medieval theologians that the corruption of the best becomes the worst, which is what explains the devil ultimately, brightest angel to the worst demon. Heaven is a city, the heavenly city. So there's something good about cities at their best. The principle of order, citizenship, harmony, law, etc. But when they become degenerate, then they've got the potential to be a lot worse than just a rural community. Mm. Yeah, well said. I think that's correct. So we're not anti-cities. It's not inherently bad. It's just they seem to be the locus for a lot of what is wrong with modern life. And in mm. John Milton's poem, Paradise Lost, Pandemonium, which is the, the infernal city where all the devils gather, that's basically a, a, a parody of modern fallen politics. People want some reading homework to explore this afterwards. We got a question, why are modern Christians obsessed with rural areas and villages? Christianity was an urban phenomenon originally. Well, this is to do with the principle of subsidiarity and the fact that local small scale communities are good. This is where power in the community resides and we don't want bigger structures taking power from them where there's no need to. So we want to devolve power on families and local organizations and being self-sustaining, being self-reliant, working close to the land as Pope Leo XIII and others argued in the agrarian movement is ultimately a form of living with humility and thrift. So you are in the world, but not of it. If your whole life is dedicated to just getting as much money as possible, then that's going to be a, a trap in many ways. It's also the an opportunity is a single for, cell society. for work. So I know single people struggle to understand this, but once you pluck like a fine grape, a, a good woman from an urban center where you probably largely go to, to increase your odds and, and to find a woman to marry, when you start producing children, the natural draw of you know, ur of, of non-urban areas of the countryside presents itself. I mean, this is just something that happens when you start having a family. It's like, I, you know, I don't know if we can quote Bill Cosby anymore because he turned out to be such a creep, but it's like, I can make, I can co-create my own people. You know, I can, I can make my own tribe here. And that's what you do. And then you just want to be away from the sweaty, pulsing, uh, uh, dirty urban centers 
So yeah, there's no no absolute hatred for cities here. We have to go there at our start in most cases to to meet one another, to get educated back in the day. But once you have what you need from cities, it's natural to if if you can get a, a good enough supply chain to retire to the the countryside and and you have your own society and you have none of the downside of the modern urban uh, center. Yeah, I think that's good advice for young guys watching, starting a family and getting out of the cities if possible. Michael, you had a thought. Oh, just it was on the last thought about uh, the uh, nobility of work and uh, and that, that connects up with the, the agrarian um, ethic. Yeah, and, and the fact that one of man's punishment specifically was sweat and toil with the body as we've talked about before and mm. there's certainly no shame in having a, a manual job or a trade out in the countryside blue collar rather than working in the city white collar doing something you don't believe in just for money that's a big mm. point nowadays yeah. now falling fertility comes next and we got the fact that as we mentioned earlier only the Christians and Jews were above replacement fertility when Rome fell. Uh, among the rest, we had childlessness starting at the top. Uh, Trajan, Nerva, Hadrian, between them, uh, lacked any legitimate issue. Um, anal intercourse was popular as birth control. The poor said they didn't have the confidence to have kids anymore, too expensive. And the rich, even though they had the money, just saw kids as a burden. I mean, why not just spend your life in orgies and feasts and trying to have as much fun as possible? The duties of parenthood they saw as just cramping their style, basically. So Tacitus writes that childlessness prevailed. We're seeing it now, aren't we? A culture that thinks life isn't worthwhile, isn't going to want to create life. Well, it's encouraged now. You know, it's, it's not merely just a side effect. I mean, it's... It, you, you just hear all all this uh, green propaganda of, about carbon footprints, and you know, aren't we aren't we just being selfish by reproducing? You know, it's a good thing that uh, that people don't reproduce because look 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 uh, look how noble we are for being uh, good global citizens of this you know uh, eco utopia that we're building. Uh, I think that's this bizarre bizarre ethic uh, that obviously connects up with. Planned Parenthood and, and, and abortion as well, but it's this 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 insane idea that you're being a good person by uh, not reproducing. It's not just neutral, but it's it's good, and that people that have families are somehow doing something selfish, and uh, you know hurting the earth. Tim, when you're out and about with your family, seven kids, do you ever get any comments from people, or do you ever get any looks? I've had a few. So, well, I've been had our entire meal paid for a couple times by anonymous sources. It happened in Idaho, generally good people. When we were hanging out uh, in my parents' cabin there. And it's, it's happened here in Mississippi where people are really impressed with going out to eat, nine people, six or, you know, five, six, seven of them are, are reasonably well behaved. Um, <laughs> And so, so folks that have, even in Protestant places like Idaho, Idaho has got its share of Mormons, so they, they like life. But um, even in generally speaking, Protestant places like Mississippi or Idaho, they have a, a pretty solid intuition that life is good and that, that death is bad. And therefore the culture of life is good and the culture of death is bad. Even if they're not doing it themselves, they, they like it. And uh, we, I was at a party the other day, a kid's party, and a uh, boomer lady, you know, aunt or something of a birthday kid walks up and says, um, wow, Seven, you got your hands full. That's what Americans say when they're being, not salty, when they're being folksy, you know, the, the Protestant Americans, they just think that's a lot. And they say, you got your hands full. And I always am like, oh man, we started late. You know, I was, I was like 26 or 27. Steph was 25 or 26. Uh, think of how much more life we could have brought forth if we would have just begun four years earlier. You know, we could have squeezed in three more kids. And that, then they always kind of turn the corner and they start reasoning 
with you for more children. So usually it's either kind of light ribbing that through force of my commentary, I, I can kind of make turn into light agreement or outright endorsement if I'm in good places. Cause I don't, I don't hang out in the cities. You know, I take my kids to Pelicans games in new Orleans. Everyone's wrong with us. The most Catholic city in America. We also go to the Latin mass there. It's the most Catholic city in America. So it's mostly fallen Catholics that still kind of know you should say nice things about it. I would just say this as regards our other topic and the agenda 2030 and the outright explicit admonitions of the world to not have kids. I would say just as grace builds upon nature, I would say the anti-life agenda top down builds on concupiscence. Mm. So it's, it's there, you know, people that want to party, they know well, kids are going to cramp your style, like you said, Will. But now, unlike the Romans, we have this top-down pressure not to have kids from the global Luciferian elite. Yeah, that's important to bear in mind. It takes a real conscious <clears throat> effort to fight back against it. I get a mixture of older guys. There's a, a gentleman in his 80s wanting to shake my hand, saying... I bet you feel weird now having a big family, but when I was a young man, it was not uncommon to have four, five kids or more. And he just wanted to say, well done. Then I get the other extreme, which is people not saying it to my face, just making a few comments that get relayed back to me, like climate change is so irresponsible. <laughs> Imagine the car he has to drive around in with all those kids and things like that. So you get both. Now, also, the yeah, Paul, the power that Veneza has brought. Can you? Hear me? I look like I'm frozen or something. I can hear you, but you're frozen a little bit. Oh, he's oh, cut out. Awesome. Hopefully, you'll awesome. come back in a second. I always tell people, I, 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 you know, I when he's gone, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. I've gotten one comment that was kind of rude. It was at a Cracker Barrel, which is a, a, a racist title for a place where a bunch of white people gather. By the way. Uh, it was from a, a, a white guy who thought he was being funny. He was like, Hey man, you, you know what, you know, what causes that, right? You know, all those kids, you know, he's making like a sex joke. And I was like, yeah. Um, and I was like, have you ever heard this? I was like, that's a good joke. Have you ever heard this one? It's, it's more true than yours. Like contraception is for guys whose wives have boyfriends. And he just stopped. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Elliot, you cut out earlier. Uh, let me know if I'm coming in clear right now. Again, yeah, yeah. Some, some kind of a delay. Is this good? We're yeah. Good? Okay, cool. Yeah, I was just going to add the false sense of power that feminine has wrought in the minds of women that it's better to have a career. Mm. Uh, r never reminding them that their eggs will rot and eggs rot a little bit earlier now than they did in the past. So we're pushing that childbearing window out to, you know, 20s late 20s 30s um and then you got women like jennifer aniston who are now realizing that freezing my eggs is not an idea and i chased worldly success through my most fertile years and now i'm uh, f feeling the effects of that uh having an empty nest uh, your entire life as a woman is a failure uh, there was a time when they would call you barren, and that was taken very uh, seriously. If a woman was barren, believed that somehow God didn't look highly upon her. Today, barrenism is seen as a, a virtue and a tool for advancement in the world, but ultimately ends up with a barren moral and spiritual and emotional sense in your life. So uh, encouraging women to marry and make babies earlier rather than later the universities is another waste of time for women uh these middle management jobs that ultimately end up going nowhere and the women spend the rest of their lives sipping wine and petting cats at home with their you know strong and independent income so uh that's a that's definitely a big part of why we're seeing this yeah for sure and that goes back to fulton sheen's point about telling women that the only way they can be valuable or valued is by acting like a man is because the role of motherhood isn't valued in a sick society.
just to make the point here about fertility rates, uh, the USA and Canada between them average around 1.6 and the replacement rate is 2.1. Europe averages 1.5. And then if we just take a few from Africa, you've got Niger, 6.8, Somalia, 6, Congo, 5.8, Chad, 5.6. So these are countries where contraception, for example, is largely still frowned upon. And Africa in many places is far more traditionally Catholic than the West is. Mm. And you can tell that from the birth rates partly. So hanging around at 1.5, that's not smart. And it leads to dependence on immigration to keep your country afloat economically. So the next one we've got is unmarried males. And Elliot's comment there about women not getting married kind of brings us into it well. So men saw marriage as a burden, especially the elites when Rome was falling. And we've got alongside the breakdown of monogamy, lots of prostitution, homosexuality, bisexuality, a bit like what we see now with the LGBTQ movement. A lot of people think it's a, a cause of what's happening in the West, but anthropologically, you can see it as more of a symptom because whenever monogamy breaks down, homosexuality goes up. The areas with the um, highest number of uh, men taking multiple women. So when monogamy stops, you get fewer guys at the top, basically just helping themselves to more women. This means that there are fewer women for the normal guys to pair off with. And you get the guys going with each other, ultimately, like in prison, for example, is a really extreme example of that. So monogamy and then strong societies go together. And Emperor Augustus asked, how can the Commonwealth be preserved if we neither marry nor produce children. So if we've got a society where guys don't want to get married or are afraid to, where are we expecting this to lead ultimately? More and more of the incel problem, more and more instability, lower and lower fertility rates, more and more of a lack of the biological father in the home, family breakdown, weakened society, more emasculation of men. And I would also add the, uh, the, the, the perpetual boyhood of men as a result. There's no reason for a man to mature if he can just you know, play with women and play video games and play with fast cars his entire life. The pressure of being a husband and a father never uh, exacts itself on him. And thus, we have what we have now, which is a culture of 40-year-old big baby boys who were just seeking mommy's titty every time they chase tail. Yeah, we, we talk about this in our book, Don't Go to College, me and Mike, arrested development everywhere. I, I'd also point out that, Elliot, your last comment was especially good. The managerial class is, has been especially potent at convincing I'd say women first, but it's done it to men in a different way. That women, that something incredibly banal, like a middle management level position is sexy and great, or even a lower management or even kind of a lower, a, a higher level grunt job. Uh, as long as you get to buy pumps and a pencil skirt and, and get to that job, as long as you're not working retail, then there's something really exciting and sexy about work. This just ain't true. Work is something that's the curse of Adam. It's masculine. We have to do it. And no one, you're not, you don't have to like it when you do it. You have to do it. The women have commandeered this role and they've been really thoroughly convinced that it's fun and sexy. It's nothing of the sort. Ask a man that's humped a shift for the last 50 years. There's nothing fun about that. Why would you willingly take that on? Similarly, the uh, managerial class has convinced men something that is a lot easier of a intellectual connection to make that really life is just all about chasing the skirt and that's you know that's supposed to be something that we look down on as a christian society and yet it's been elevated so if you want to know if you want to find a locus in quo then look no further than book five of plato's republic i'm always reminding people how toxic Plato is and how, how good Aristotle is. We'll go to book five of the Republic 
And it's it's really ghastly. I, I think these uh, Agenda 2030, World Economic Forum, uh, population control goons really sincerely do read Book Five of the Republic, where Plato talks about, well, you know, a lot of the men, the guardian class, the wives aren't even going to be, they're going to be common wives. Uh, they'll reproduce, they'll all live with the guardians. They'll be the only ones, more or less, that are allowed by a phony lottery system to reproduce. Uh, no one will know each other. Brother and sister can even lay with one another as guardians. It's really creepy stuff. And, and all the rest of the population is going to be fooled by these phony, phony lotteries that they're basically not are allowed to reproduce. I, I'm convinced that these goons are looking at Plato. And Aristotle just says, this is nonsense. The fa he doesn't say the family is the single cell of society, but he says the, the child belongs to the father, not to the state. And that begins the noble tradition of, uh, you know, Western minarchism and, and, and subsidiarity. It begins right there with Aristotle rejecting these utopian fantasies of Plato. It's perverse. Yeah, you know, the other point they differ on big time is Plato saying that there's no real division of labor. No social role belongs to a man or a woman just by virtue of their sex. He acknowledges that men are slightly better at the more physically demanding tasks, but Nothing like Aristotle saying that man and woman work together in harmony, bringing their gifts and throwing them into the common stock. So they're actually built for different roles to complement each other. Plato doesn't acknowledge this. So to the extent that we've got gender dysphoria and the modern industrial office environment giving us jobs that doesn't really matter whether you're a man or a woman, whether you can do them or not, that's all Plato's idea of how society is supposed to work. Whereas Aristotle is having a male body, a female body, means you have particular duties and a calling to them. Yeah, Plato actually says the female guardians should not be allowed to spend their time mothering. Uh, they should do the work of the male guardians. They'll be worse at it, but they should do the same jobs. So we actually, the whole system is geared around, aside from the fact that they have to birth children, there should be wet nurses so they can go back to work. Plato's a goon. He also can't solve the problem of the universals. He doesn't understand pros and equivocity. He can tell you there's a red. He can't tell you how Santa's suit is red. So Pla Plato's overrated. Read Aristotle, folks. I've forgotten which church, uh, <laughs> church father it was who said that uh, Plato, he thought, wrote with a, a demon whispering in his ear. I have to find it out. It's a good line because there's, there's a lot that's very evil and subversive in him, even though he gets some things right as well. But yeah, a demon whispering in the ear. Um, on this idea of breaking down the family structure, which was, of course, the main aim of Marxism in one sentence, destruction of the nuclear family, we've got Pope Leo XIII saying that the family may be regarded as the cradle of the republic, and it is in great measure within the, within the circle of family life that the destiny of cities is determined. Whence it is that they who would tear cities away from Christian principles go to the root of things and plot to corrupt family life, which makes sense of a lot of the comments that we've just been exploring there. If you mess up the relationship between men and women, you affect children, and then chaos snowballs from that. Sign number five, abortion. Many women in falling Rome killed themselves in the course of abortion attempts or became infertile. They also threw babies in the sewers. There was a big excavation, really terrible, about 200 babies discovered in one sewer. And they also left them in the street for animals to eat. Now, the point here is that once you've reached that level of depravity, that level of moral numbness, then you are blind to a lot of things. Aquinas talks about how lust, for example, can make the intellect disordered. So things that we should be able to perceive clearly intellectually become harder for us. We become more deranged. I think this is a great example of it. What are your thoughts on this? Abortion is at record levels in England and Wales currently. I don't know about the US, but I imagine it's going to be up there. Yeah, I can't think of a, a more... We can think about it the uh, with the pleasure angle, right? Because, of course, this is what all the sex is about. 
you know, it's not about pre reproduction, but also the power angle as well, right? I don't know if there's some sense of a, a, a power trip that's present when one says, I get to determine who lives and who doesn't. And so I know that I've seen these alleys and signs and t-shirts these women will wear that almost belie their ultimate motive, which is to be the gods of their own lives. We just got someone commenting that Jews are the enemy. If you carry on with that shit, I will ban you because we all know that there's that narrative out there, but ultimately we've got the fact that it's sin, it's Satan. You can't just point the finger at one particular group and expect there's no responsibility involved. So why was any subversion possible? A strong culture is not going to get subversive. We're talking about the idea of susceptibility to weakness and free will being the root of moral evil. So if you want to look under your bed every night before you go to sleep, check in for a different ethnic group as the source of all your problems, enjoy yourself, but don't come and talk about it in the chat. I'm one of the few people who had the balls to interview E. Michael Jones. I've got the channel strike because of it. You can go and watch the interview if you want to, but if you carry on like that in the chat here, then no more from you. All right, guys, sorry about that. I was just saying uh, prior to Elliot's comment that I can't think of a, a really a symptom of a more uh, degraded culture than where not just killing babies, but encouraging women to see killing their own children, infanticide as not just a right, but something that now they have like the shout your abortion movement, right? That it's, it's not just a right. It's not just something that was uh, tragic and allowed, but it's something to be, be celebrated. Uh, and that to me, it's see, that seems symptomatic of the idea of just, you can either come to terms with sin and your own depravity and seek forgiveness or double down. And it seems like that's what that is. It's, you know, you, you have to double down on it. Oh, this is a great thing. It's the, it's the ultimate expression of, of, um, of one's own rights or, or maybe it's absolutely horrific. So I think that's an expression of, uh, of what the abortion, um, uh, heralding is. And it, it's, it's the culture doubling down on, oh no, this is a great thing, uh, which is absolutely just, just despicable. Tim, what do you think about that doubling down? I think that's a big part of it. Well, it's why pride is the diabolic sin. I mean, all sins are diabolical, but if you can, because of the nature of redemption, the nature of confession, no sin except that which convinces one not to go to confession or to make some act of contrition. No sin is really deadly. I mean, all, all they're a bunch of mortal sins, but they're not truly deadly if they can be confessed and disowned. Pride, you know, literally convincing someone not only to stay neutral or stay mum, um, moreover, of course, don't, don't go to confession. It would admonish you, but, but to shout your sin with pride is the diabolical sin because... Of course, it's it's the only one that will will uh, land a bunch of partisans for Satan in hell. Uh, it, you know, theologically, I think that's you know, Mike nailed it. And of course, it's the sin that is most associable with Satan: the uh, uh, sexual abuse and or the murder of children, which witchcraft, you know, witchy stuff. It all makes sense, man, and it's all coming full circle too. Don't don't make any mistake, like. When we were growing up in the 80s, you know, if some kid dressed up for Halloween as a witch, you know, with a wart on her chin and a green face, you just think that's, you know, that's something I saw in The Wizard of Oz. It seems utterly cartoonish. But now, I mean, the last 10 years, since all this witchy stuff has gone forward facing, it's gone public. Starting for me in 2016 with Marina Abramovich, but there, there was a lot of it out there before then. Now it's just like, shoot, that's that's heavy duty to talk about witchcraft is to talk about uh, pedophilia and abortion and mass child murder. And it is the greatest uh, sacramental, the anti-sacramental 
for Satan. I, I have a, a, a book. It's a Catholic book by uh, these two Polish guys that do a bunch of different books on relics. And they say there are the 10 anti-commandments of the communists. And the first one, the first sacrament was abortion. Yeah, it's uh, like saying this is my body from the Eucharist, but then saying I'm going to do whatever the hell I want with it. So there's some kind of inversion going on there. I think that's exactly right, Tim. And uh, the idea that people are being forced to do this by some other ethnic group, I think, really falls apart at the abortion point because this is about your choice. And why are we below replacement fertility in the UK? Well, abortion. If there were no abortions, that's about 200,000 more kids per year. So the same guys who really buy this idea that whites are uniquely under threat by other people wanting to exterminate them, they're marching you off to the abortion clinics, are they? Making you go ahead with it. How about you just stop doing that first and then bang, straight away, you're above replacement fertility. So it's about the personal responsibility. Stein number six, we've got trashing tradition. So being below replacement fertility meant that Rome had to depend on immigrants, even for things like manning its own army. You didn't get the sons of the soldier farmers anymore filling the Roman ranks. They needed to get mercenaries from the Germanic tribes. But the immigrants didn't follow the Roman traditions because the Roman elites themselves no longer really upheld or believed in them. So the idea here is that the rot starts at the top. Once you get the people at the head of a culture not upholding it, not sustaining it, then the whole thing begins to collapse and degrade. We see this in the media and academia, don't we? Yeah. I mean, all the, um, the figureheads that we look to in media and, and in academia are, yeah, they're all like far left uh, Satanists or weirdos, uh, and they're radically anti-tradition. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not, it's not, they're not just modernists. They're like postmodernists at this point. And, uh, I mean, you, you quoted like Robin Dembroff or that other person that they quoted Dembroff about, um, you know, educating the children on LGBT, um, you know, nonsense. And it's like, yeah, that. That is academia now, and it's in mainstream media. So the the tops of the institutions are are satanic at this point. Yeah, so much of it is top down from people who aren't only failing to transmit tradition, but actively hate it and want to turn kids off from it. Is this just another victim narrative where parents should? point the finger at schools students should point the finger at professors or is the family supposed to be the primary educator anyway and people need to take responsibility for this rather than buy into a victim narrative i mean could like does, I will does agree responsibility with you. have yeah. to apportion both ways though sorry about that right. no it's good does does apportion does does responsibility have to be zero sum i mean can you si simultaneously say, yeah, it is on the um, the individual and on uh, parents and families to raise and educate their own kids in traditional, benign, uh, virtuous ways, and it's also the case that there are these these pernicious institutions and, and actors out there that have their own free will and uh, their their own agency, and they're promoting bad stuff, and they need to be called out. I, I think that 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 those things both hang together for sure and then the parents need to recognize that it's probably harder now they have more of a duty now than ever before to counteract that which is probably why you've got homeschooling on the up in the us and the uk and in europe generally elliot what was your thought along the same lines that uh it's interesting that when I became, when I reverted back to the Catholic faith, I discovered how beautiful it was only because I didn't understand it to begin with. And to be raised in a, uh, a culture that doesn't remember its roots is 
big part of the reason why we're falling to the side. And I think that if more people knew their history, that knew their tradition, uh, if they were aware of it, I think they would love it. I think the thing is that we're, we're, we're fed modernism, we're fed progressivism, uh, we're led to believe that this is uh, desirable because of whatever, quote unquote, freedom we believe we have as a result of uh, breaking ourselves of the oppressive past, which of course is mostly a lie anyway that has been perpetrated by Hollywood, you know, the media, uh, schools, and our false history that's taught to our children. But the beauty of tradition, and just look at architecture, right? Like modern buildings are trash. Modern architecture is garbage. Modern art is ugly. Uh, the, just a, a, It doesn't take much just to look at what was being produced in a time when people on tradition or lived the traditional way in terms of art and architecture to say that there actually there must be something divine. There must be something beautiful that was unfolding back then that's not available now. I think every, I, I would imagine that every time period looks back and says, oh boy, great thing we've come so far, but you, you can't have brain cells to put together and look back or look at what we've got now and then compare it to just in terms of beauty, what was available back then and realize that we've, we've, we've really lost our way because of this rejection, rejection of tradition. Yeah, even, even our Pope said within two weeks, tradition is infidelity, which just underscores the point that all of the institutions, including the one that's part divine, the Holy Catholic Church, have been badly infiltrated. If if even the the pontiff, Pontifus Maximus, is uh, saying that that tradition is infidelity to the magisterium. Yeah, important to remember. Question here: You should get the fresh and fit crew on. They have a big influence on young men. They get a lot right in terms of helping men embrace masculinity and their role of being a provider, protector. I think it's telling that you haven't listed procreator there as well of the three pillars of masculinity, procreate, provide, protect, because as far as I'm aware, those guys get it wrong on procreation and they're feminist in the sense that they are pro promiscuity, this red pill alpha idea. And that's how you, as we've explained in this episode and others, ultimately fragment the family and undermine men. So unless they're disavowing, the sexual revolution, which is basically fornication, contraception, then exactly what part of it do they disagree with and why are they not feminists? So I would put those guys in the category of the new feminism, same as the old feminism, but just looks kind of cool and a lot of guys fall for it. Any thoughts on that, guys? Yeah, they, uh, it was actually it was when Zuby was on their podcast, that was actually the genesis of Yumi and Tim talking about that and, and Tate and... Uh, I guess that's sort of a precursor to this podcast um, because you'll see those guys and their audience, they'll simultaneously argue for having a harem, you know, uh, attracting and fornicating with as many women as possible. And then in the very next breath, they'll critique the, the degradation of, of modern society and the breakdown of civic order, et cetera. And it's like, you can't have it both ways. Both of those things are, are, are intertwined. And, uh, you know, I think that that's, that needs to be pointed out to them that, you know, they can't simultaneously, they can't hang with that hypocrisy without it being pointed out. Um, and like I said, I, I, I came from that culture. I took part in that culture for a long time and, you know, I'm, I'm not without sin or, um, dirty hands in that regard, but I think that's at least something that that hypocrisy needs to be brought brought to bear with those guys and their followers yeah just to be clear this this dude wants us to do that he wants us to point out to them what they're missing and he says most importantly they need jesus so ah, okay. if they That's if they want to come on the podcast we're happy to talk to them but it would largely be disagreement over fundamentals and agreement on superficials because are you really going to be uh, protecting and providing 
if you're not a biological father in the home and if you're worsening the culture that the kids are going to grow up in. To me, that sounds like attacking the root of society in the way that Pope Leo XIII outlined rather than protecting it and transmitting it properly. Right, sign number seven, we've got feminism more broadly speaking. Tim had a great line a couple of episodes ago that it's the boneyard of civilizations. And Sir John Glove's work on this makes it clear as well. He surveys the whole of human history and says, look, when you see feminism arriving, it's a harbinger of the demise. We know that something bad is going to be happening because men have abdicated authority. Women are stepping in to fulfill the gap. This is a sign of a uh, weak society. So motherhood is devalued, as we've commented. And there's a remark from the historian Jerome Carpuccino, who says that by copying men too closely, the Roman woman succeeded more rapidly in emulating man's vices than in acquiring his strength. So what we see is that feminism means basically men behaving like boys, and women behaving like boys as well, hence the rise of lad culture among girls. So drinking, partying, promiscuity, etc. These things are both sexes falling to the level of lowest common denominator, and it's another kind of gender dysphoria and androgyny. Any thoughts on this? Yeah, I think it's also um, a precursor to the swelling, swelling uh, tyrannical leftist state apparatus where, you know, the, the feminism, it's not, it, it's a direction of travel. So what began at Niagara Falls has now morphed into second wave, third wave, fourth wave feminism. There's, there's a woman at Oxford, I forget her name, I was just looking her up, but she's arguing for uh, the right to sex. So no, this isn't negative right, liberty, you know, the uh, allowed it to be sex. It's the positive right to sex, an entitlement to sex. So the direction of travel of that thesis, you know, if you read between the lines, is a kind of state-imposed sexual jury duty for uh, women that uh, demand sex from men. That's the direction of travel. Um, if you read the Scum Manifesto, the Society for Cutting Up Men, who was written by, um, I forget, uh, she shot Andy Warhol. Um, but anyways, her, her whole argument was uh, we just need to just get rid of men entirely. We should just exterminate them and use um, sperm banks to reproduce only women. Um, so, yeah, feminism is a direction of travel, and it the next iterations of that direction of travel look absolutely like some science fiction horror movie. I'm, I'm still horrified what portions of Christians, what portion of Catholics, and even what portion of traditional Catholics think that any wave of feminism, any iteration of it can coexist peaceably with Christianity. They're, they're, it's just not. It's not. Uh, it's an oxymoron. So I've done a lot of work, given a lot of talks, written a book on the utter in incompatibility of feminism with Christianity. But I guess today's show would require us to broaden it out a little bit and say any healthy society uh, suffers from feminism showing up. And that's, that's why it's especially useful, well, to have this as the seventh principle because even pagan Rome thrived in a pre-Christian setting, you know, early, early in its life and decayed later. And, you know, the utter watchword of a de decaying society is the decaying of the single cell of that society, which is the family that always begins with men behaving like boys, or I, I say men behaving like women, women behaving like men. It's gender dysphoria that leads to feminism, and it's the mark of all decaying Western societies. That's it. A couple of questions to finish. A little bit of pushback from our friend Alaric again. Male feminists are those who support feminism. Red pillars don't support feminism. A lot of them were our men's rights activists, but no one cares about men's rights, only obligations. 
Well, if red pillars support promiscuity, if they support fornication, if they support contraception, if, to be honest, they support the idea that a man is just supposed to live his own life, do his own thing, and buy into that whole individualized, atomistic worldview of liberalism, then that's all tied up with feminism. So if you're accepting what the sexual revolution is built on and trying to spin that into an alpha myth of what it means to be a man, then that's just feminism, even if you don't realize it. And as for rights and obligations, they don't really even make sense without each other. The whole idea of individual human rights can be pushed to absurdity in the idea of a a right to abortion, for example, or the right to a holiday or the right to free porn online just because you feel like it. The rights and duties only really make sense together and within the context of the family too. So these guys who want more authority as single men thinking I should have authority over women because I'm just a guy walking down the street. That's not how it works. The authority of the man is within the family for the common good of that society. What do you guys think about people like this who claim they're not feminist while still acting like a feminist in all the ways that undermine society most. Well, of course, they're benefiting from feminism in every way that you just described. So I don't think anybody who uh, can be logical would argue with what you're saying. The feminist revolution brought us percept. It brought us fornication. It brings us... Uh, even even uh, divorce, you know, which these guys rail out against. A lot of these men right activists are um, they they're men who have had bad divorces, and as a result, now as uh, men right activists activists. But that is once again, um, you know, fruit of why well, these guys can be fem. They're again, I guess they would be against uh, divorce. But anyway, it's most of the things that these guys are um, benefiting from that uh, that they don't realize is a fruit of feminism. So they are actually closet feminists. Yeah, I agree. I think that's the saddest trick that's been played on men in that many of them will now fight to the hilt for what they believe makes them alpha, not realizing that it's just a form of feminism. Mm -hmm. Yep, we're not saying so that they're, by the way, we're not saying that they're, these red pill guys are de dicto feminists. We're saying they're de facto feminists. Yeah, which is yeah. yeah, which is why so many, uh, when it is pointed out to them, are slightly bemused by it. And they they can't figure out how that can be the case. But you got to get back to fundamentals, Michael. Yeah, I was going to say, in a sense, they're also leftists too, right? Because if they're not practicing weaponized chastity and they're fornicating like crazy and promoting fornication amongst men and women, and then that's withering the uh, natural uh, family unit, then that's just going to promote, promote more and more statism as a uh, necessary side effect. So they're also leftists in that regard. Right. Final question to finish. I think, uh, Alaric, you've got some good questions. You're reflecting the mood of many men. Why should we support a system that doesn't care about men? I'd rather see it crumble. Let nature do its thing so that we may usher in a new golden age where women are happy to make me a sandwich. First of all, you're not the kind of guy with the attitude who deserves to have a sandwich made for him. So let's just make that clear. But your first question, why should men support a system that doesn't care about them? This goes to the heart of what masculinity is, doesn't it? How do we define the system, though? I think that's the question. You know, what what is it? Mm -hmm. Blind obedience to the state? Is it uh, subordinating one's self to the institu institution of the Catholic Church? Like, what what system are we talking about? I think is going to be the really the detail here that we need to figure out. For sure, I'm thinking this is about what human nature means, what natural law means for the good of men and for the good of the family. So you can either roll with this, roll with the kind of creature you are as a rational animal and what the contours of what your being are that you need to follow to flourish, or you can flail against them and hope that something's going to happen at some point, but it won't. And the idea that a man only does something if he's going to get personally rewarded by it in the short term, 
that's the kind of childish attitude. If you look at some of the previous episodes where we talk about self-sacrifice and doing the right thing and it taking courage, even if it might just be a life of hardship and obstacles, that's what should really motivate a man. The ability to stick with the right thing, even though it's difficult. Yeah, also, women don't make you a sandwich like a woman does. Yeah. And I mean, again, it sounds like some snotty, like, counterpunch, but it's the, the, the framework of the question seems to reflect vast understanding. Uh, the same thing like patriarchy. The reason I'm a patriarch is because I have one woman and I, uh, you know, I rule over her as a, as close to a benign monarch as I, I can. And we have a good time and we have kids and I'm the patriarch of the family it means power to fathers. I'm not, I don't, I don't have power over, you know, Elliot's wife or Will's wife. That's not how it works. It's not like all the, yeah, there's a, a kind of habitus of being a wife. If I went over to Will's house or Elliot's house, or you guys came over to my house, it would probably be the wives doing this by extension of, uh, you know, one, the way one household interacts with another. But I, the goal is really to find one good woman. That's all you have to do. You don't have to find 10. This is the same thing I tell the MGDAO guys. It's like, you have to find one. It's it's harder probably on average than it was 100 years ago, probably harder then than 100 years before that. But all you gotta do is find one, man. And that, that one woman, you know, if, if, if you have the desiderata that she's looking for in a man, she, she'd be happy to get you whatever flavor of sandwich you want. Yeah, that's it. And men are, in a sense, the, the pillars of culture anyway. So by supporting the way things should be, you strengthen the system. By trying to check out of it or walk away, you're going to weaken it and make it crumble further. So each man has the choice in his life about which way things are going to go, better or worse. You can contribute to the problems or you can try to counteract them. All right, guys, great comments today. Thanks for the questions as well. And you gentlemen as well. Pleasure to talk with you as always. And who's up next? That'd be me. I think it's back to you, isn't oh, it, Tim? Yeah. yeah. I, I think it's back to me. So ne next week we'll uh, have an exciting C mask on uh, Timothy Gordon's channel. Everybody out there, remember to go subscribe to all four of our YouTube channels so you can get weekly content until we we grease the skids and have all of the shows on all the channels that's it so you can check out elliot on his youtube channel elliot holes two l's two t's tim is on rules for retrogrades michael's on youtube as well i'll put all the links up as well as people's twitter and Substack and instagram too in the video description all right guys thanks for joining us and we will see you again next week same time on tim's channel take care awesome thanks guys Thanks, fellas.